How do I pronounce your first name so I don't mess it up? Just like the president, Ulysses. Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant. And now, what? Now, I, I've never met anyone with your first name. Do you mind just telling us how your parents came up with it, real quick, for you? Uh, well, my um, I'm a junior. Okay. Uh, but my grandfather was um, the superintendent of the prison system in Cuba, Ooh. and. Uh, yeah, that's kind of crazy. That's crazy. And, uh, mm -hmm. He named his children like, you know, like big mythological names, you know. I love so, it. He yeah. named my dad Ulysses with the idea that uh, we tend to live up to our names. I think that is a cool name. I, thank you for sharing. So thank you again for joining uh, me and my little podcast. You know, I was so here, glad to you know hear from you last week when you wrote me an email talking about how you were listening to the show. And I was excited to kind of read about your story. I've interviewed a lot of people with spinal cord injuries. You, however, have a very unique story. You were doing a lot in your life up until you were injured a few years ago. You were a former MMA fighter, right? <laughs> Amateur, you have to have um, the way the MMA the way um, MMA works is you have to have ten amateur fights under your belt, and then they allow you to go pro. So oh. I only had four in the local the local market, um, but I was doing well. I was on my way. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you were also um, doing biz. You're like an actor too. Was that something you were interested in before your injury as well? Yeah, I did a little bit of acting, mostly some small, what they would call independent films, because okay. Chicago, Chicago is a big theater town, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of small uh, independent films. Oh, I bet they do. That's where you're from. So do, are you born and raised, or not born and raised, or where are you from exactly? Um, I, um, I was born in Chicago. Okay. I was born with severe asthma, and then so... My grandparents, who had retired from General Electric, they bought uh, they bought land in the Dominican Republic because yeah. it resembles it resembles Cuba. My my parents are Cuban immigrants, yeah. so I was raised on a farm until I was out until I was about ten. Wow! wow. I was brought back up to Chicago after okay. I had uh, you know I beat I beat the asthma because of you know the organic diet and nice. the lifestyle of being on a farm. So, yeah. That sounds like a beautiful upbringing in the Dominican Republic. Was it like just jungle everywhere? What were they growing out there? I mean, it was literally like, um, like super tropical. I mean, like I would climb coconut trees and mango trees and everything we ate was off the land. And I remember milking the cows and cool. you know, I would ride a horse bareback just grabbing the horse's mane and wow. um yeah i mean i think it's something that uh there's a big disconnect now with uh with nature like most kids in the united states they don't know anything about you know um identifying with nature i mean like they don't know you know someone had to kill the chicken the tree <laughs> No kidding, right? Not enough kids in the cities know. There's a lot of rural kids in the U.S. that do know where chickens come from, but the city city kids don't know nothing. So oh, let me ask you this. When you moved to Chicago, was that crazy moving back to Chicago then? Well, yeah, it was a culture shock. I mean, the kids, you know, they're different. You know, it's, um, you know, you can't compare a huge industrial commercial city like Chicago to, you know, third world, no. uh, third world tropical <laughs> environment. So for me, it was a big culture shock, yeah. but, uh, but I adjusted well and Good. grew up in the city. Cool. So, all right. So how would, I know your injury happened in 2018 and we're going to get to how that happened. But the reason I'm kind of going from your, your early years is just because I always like to know how someone where everybody was at right when your injury occurred so you're kind of back in Chicago you're making your way and I imagine you went back to high school and were pretty cool because you're a big guy you were like were you fighting in high school and stuff like what was your were you well, doing course, athletics in high school I mean I was um I was a really um a rough kid 
Uh-huh. So I got sent to a military academy. Oh, you did? Wow. I got wow. sent to St. John's in uh, Delafield, Wisconsin, which at the time yeah. was like, the third best military academy in the country. And yeah. my dad did that because I just simply needed the discipline. Because wow. Chicago in the 90s was uh, really crazy. I mean, people think Chicago is rough now because of all the shootings, but mm-hmm. that's nothing compared to how rough it was in the 90s. So my dad tried to um, help me navigate that yeah. and send me to a military school. But I was always in athletics. I mean, I uh, uh, pop water football, pop water right. baseball, high yeah. school football, wrestling. And then um, I was always inclined <clears throat> to anything that, anything that has to do with a collision. Like, you know, with football, I played, oh, my God, I played, um, you know, like 12 years of minor league football. Cool. Two years, yeah, two years of arena football. What position? Running back. Wow. And, uh, yeah, running back and sometimes outside linebacker. I love to watch that. Running backs are my favorite position to watch. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the guy with the ball. I know, right? <laughs> it's the guy with the ball. I bet you you love it or was – is it is football was a, a love of yours or were you just good at it so you decided to do it? No, no, football was a um, it was almost like a primal it was a primal passion. Like when I first discovered it when I was I was like ten no no I was like twelve in grammar school and mm-hmm. I was still adjusting to being here in the States. And some guy was like, some kid, you know, we were playing in the snow. Mm -hmm. The guy's like, all right. So the guy with the ball, you could grab him and slam him on the ground. (laughs) I was like, what? Get out of here. (laughs) And he was like, yeah, the guy with the ball, Mm -hmm. you know, you could could slam him on the ground. And I did that. And it was such a high. And then he was like, now it's your turn. (laughs) <laughs> give you the ball and they're going to try to slam you on the ground <laughs> and I just to me it was just such a you know like a high like wait a minute <clears throat> I could be violent and it's okay no penalties <laughs> yeah no penalties I mean like I could I could slam another kid to the ground and you know the teachers or no one's going to say anything to me so for me <laughs> It was like a natural fit. I was like, yes, I can do this. And then later on, you know, when I was in my late 20s and third and early 30s, I really got attracted to uh, fighting. Like I just, um, yeah. you know, the whole aspect of being disciplined and you know, utilizing your your body as an instrument, you know, like I was really into, I mean, my workout routines were insane. I mean, I would wake up at four in the morning, throw on a 50 pound weight vest. What? Go, go mm-hmm. jogging for two or three miles, wow. come back, drink a shake, lift weights for an hour, and then go to my jujitsu gym for wow. two hours, do, wow. an hour and a, a, do an hour and a half of Muay Thai and then an hour of jujitsu. And then that's all before I started my day. Then I would rinse off and go to work. <laughs> so, um, but it's part of my personality. I, I was just too, um, whatever you want to call it, like too much testosterone or too much, you know, uh, too much energy. I, For me, if I wasn't doing something physical, I um, I would lose my mind. Like I, I would have to do something intense. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's part of the reason why I got injured because mm-hmm. I owned a small residential rental business and I was getting around fine. I'm 
in my to my appointments mm -hmm. on a motorcycle that's called a cruiser. It's yeah. one of the ones you sit on. Yep. <laughs> but then I wanted to get to my appointments faster. Yeah. And a sports bike. And in Chicago with the traffic, you have to be real careful. That's exactly what happened. I uh, I got cut off in traffic. Mm -mm. Young guy driving an SUV and I, I got hurt. That's crazy. You know, was it the middle of the day? It was, um, yeah, it was like uh, three in the afternoon. Yep. So he obviously didn't see you, right? Start seeing motorcycles, people. Yeah, he was, <laughs> um, yeah, he was um, using a parking lot to turn his vehicle around. Mm -hmm. And apparently he didn't see me. Wow. But, it, but it's ironic because uh, he didn't see me and struck me. And then he gave me CPR until the ambulance got there. Man, so it's hard to not like the guy a little bit, huh? Since he made up for what he did wrong. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, cute. Huh? Yeah, but he had no insurance and that made things a little tougher. Yeah. But, um, was, he a, was he a young kid? From what I gather, he was a young guy. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe, you know, maybe fresh out of the military. I don't know yeah. something because, you know, most people don't know CPR. No, no. So what age were you at the time of your injury back in 2018? <laughs> what was um, 40, uh, 41. You were 41. Okay, so now you're in your mid-40s. And what level of injury to, was it a C3? Oh, C3 and C5. C3 to C5. So my C3 is fused to my C4. Okay. My C5 is fused to my C6. So when you got injured, did you kind of know right away what happened to you? Or did you, do you remember the injury at all? No, no, but um, the... Uh, the ironic thing with the injury is that I didn't feel any of it. Mm -hmm. I I felt the sensation of my teeth shattering. Oh. But then I went into a dream state and I woke up 10 days later. Yep, that's crazy. And like, why do you think that happened? The dreams, that's such an interesting thing. It was just re reaction to your injury? Well, the doctors explained it to me that it's called DMT, which is a chemical that your body releases into your brain <clears throat> and into your nervous system, I guess to like calm you and prevent you from going mm -hmm. into terminal shock. Oh, you know, wow. so it's like one of these things where I guess it's like a um, like a protective measure. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, pal this is really going to be hard on you. Mm -hmm. So let me give you something to distract you while you get through this. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. Like I don't, I didn't have any pain. I didn't, ex I didn't know anything until I woke up. Wow. I didn't, I did not know. I did not know anything. I didn't know anything. I don't, I didn't recall anything. Well, that's maybe for the best. You know, you're waking up in a hospital room very disoriented, I bet, though, probably asking what the heck happened, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was in complete shock. I mean, one minute, you know, I'm living the dream. Mm -hmm. And the next minute I'm waking up, waking up in the hospital. So, yeah. I mean, I knew it was serious because of people's expressions. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So what was it like, you know, when you're first feeling your body, you know, being paralyzed and as a former very, you're saying very athletic kind of person, what was that like and how, you know, how are you dealing with that as someone that used to be very, very physical? Well, I mean, for me, it's surreal. Like I, um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an ongoing battle. Okay. Between gratitude and like disparity. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like you're grateful that you're alive. Yeah. You're grateful that you made it, but you're very disappointed and 
you know, it, it feels like uh, something that's parallel to a nightmare, but you just have to be mature, be mm -hmm. calm, be patient, and realize that, hey, the reality is you were involved in an accident, and now you have to do the best you can mm -hmm. with what you have. Yeah. That's good. And, you know, and I think physical therapy and getting out of your chair and moving with the help of people is really great. Are you able to like access any kind of really good therapy nowadays? Or are you done with all that? Well, no, I'm not done. I mean, I need, I need a lot more. Yeah. There was, um, I was attending a facility called Stay and Step. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Which is intensive. Why do you say, have you heard of them? Yeah, there's a lot of activity-based therapy gyms all around. And I think I've heard of that one in Chicago, Chicago, right? No, they're in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay, cool. But it's the kind of place that also gets you out of your chair and gets you activity-based therapy, right? Yeah, it's, it's what I would categorize as. It's very, very cool. It helps a lot of people gain more function for sure. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I was doing that for about five or six months, but I ran out of funding. Right. I have, yeah, I have Medicaid yeah. and it doesn't cover my, um, it doesn't cover intensive therapy. No, it does not. Yes. Yeah, no. so now I have to uh, get creative and find some resources. Well, I hope you can find some because I know people that raise money using Hope Help Live and all these other sites too to help raise the money for their therapy because you should get more therapy, I think. Yeah. What's well, that site called, that website? Uh, Hope Help Live, hopehelplive.org. And I even have a fundraiser on there too. And you can have a fundraiser on there for free and you can help you know, get, bring attention to your issue. I could definitely point you in the right direction after the podcast. All right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You're a perfect candidate for it. Honestly, they yeah. cater to people with spinal cord injuries particularly. So yeah, because this is good to have something going on like that. So you feel like you can get maybe out, you know, get back to where you're at when it comes to exercising. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. I want to, I definitely want to be more functional. Yeah. The thing right now is, uh, neurological pain oh, I, have really? insane, I have insane neurological pain oh, no. I mean it's persistent and I need I really need to get that under control yep I hear about this all the time from so many people is it one of those things where you feel like your body's like burning then or what is it what's it like exactly yeah it feels like um yeah that's a good metaphor it feels like um it feels like your body's on fire and you can't turn it off. Mm. And it happened all the time. Is there any medication that can help or any? Yeah, I mean, I'm on medications now, but good, good. I try to take it easy on the medications. You don't want to become no. overly dependent on medications. And they don't always work either. Like gabapentin, I heard, doesn't always really work anyways. And it's like always kind of like sort of helps. It doesn't really 100% get rid of it, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm on gabapentin, mm -hmm. dantrolene. Yeah, Aquafin mm -hmm. and um, whatever robots, and I think yeah, y yeah, it sucks. I know. I, I I wish they could figure out like a better treatment for this kind of pain that people go through. It's such. I feel like it's such a cruel thing. You know, being paralyzed is already hard enough, and then you have to deal with the pain on top of it. And it just seems like oh, I just do you ever like um, do any kind of like talk therapy or anything like that to try to deal oh, with the struggle. I I mean, I do everything. Mm -hmm. My thing right now is that um, I want to remove the hardware that's mm -hmm. in my neck. Oh, really? Because I just feel that it's impending. Like, I feel that it's interfering with the energy and the prana mm -hmm. that travels up and down your spine. Definitely. Uh, do you think they can remove it? Do they tell you that's possible? Yeah, I mean, they, they can remove it. Cool. Um, I spoke to one doctor that doesn't want to remove it because he says that they did a great job and mm -hmm. that, you know, I shouldn't be feeling any pain because of it, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yo, you don't know my body. Like, I'm telling you, I'm yeah. telling you that I have pain. 
And yeah. then I have another doctor that, um, you know, they're willing to remove it, but they don't accept Medicaid. Oh, no. So, what? Yeah. yeah, so I, uh -uh. that's where I'm at now, trying to find a doctor that I could work with because I want to remove the hardware in my neck. Wow. Oh, I've had my hardware in my neck for 28 years, but I've never had any pain associated with my injury ever. I just am numb everywhere. Just numb. <laughs> so Where, uh, what, what, what level are you? Where are you at? I'm a C6. I'm like chest down and it's just numb. I've, I've always been fascinated by the pain stuff because I don't have any pain and I have a very complete injury. It's just numb. No pain, no burning, nothing. It's just numb. So it's weird. And you're, and you're complete? Mm -hmm. um technically an incomplete I have a torn spinal cord so a little bit still intact and I can feel like my left foot my left like my left calf and little areas but nothing too significant and like no I movement can, I can feel everything oh and and move everything no way yeah but just limited like I can feel my legs I can move my foot mm -hmm. I can feel my right wrist nice I can move my fingers in my left hand. Can you raise your arms up at all? I can move. I could do a curl nice. with right with my right arm, and I could slightly move my left arm to the outside. Wow. You're seriously an incomplete injury then, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, my thing is the hardware and then some type of healing and then intensive therapy. Man, I really hope you get back into it. I think if you got back into therapy, you could probably get a lot more, you know, since you're already moving your arms a little bit, you could go far in therapy, Ulysses. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I hope we can help bring attention to your story, even with this podcast, and we can get you to raise some money. I know ugh, there's so many expensive places around the country, whether it's Project Walk or Next Step, they all charge like oh, at least a hundred bucks an hour, right? It's expensive. It's so expensive. It's very expensive, but mm -hmm. I'm just disappointed that in such a wealthy country, it's so difficult for a disabled person yeah. to get access to good, you know, to good, good therapy. I mean, it should. No, I know. It's sad how they cut you off. If you're on Medicaid, you get about maybe three to four months of regular physical therapy, maybe some outpatient therapy, and then you're definitely done by six or seven months post-injury. And then they just expect you to go home and live your life in a wheelchair. But we all know if you have years of physical activity-based therapy, you can get a lot more function back. But it's it costs hundreds of dollars and no insurance company in the United States will ever pay for that. Even if you're rich and on good insurance, they won't pay for it. it has to be all paid out of pocket. And I feel the same way though, as you do. It should be cheaper. It should be more accessible. And it's really a case of the haves and the have nots when it comes to paralysis a lot of the times as well. I know that it sucks. I've no, I've only was able to get like maybe a couple hours of activity-based therapy just for fun like six years ago. It's a dream. It would be a dream to go on a regular basis, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's it should be a regular part of your life. I agree. So, well, so now let's talk about you as a dad. I know you have a couple sons, right? Yeah. What has that been like now as a dad, you know, transitioning, you know, a dad with spinal cord injury? Are you trying your best to make, make things work, of course, as a dad who's not able to, you know, do what he used to be able to do? Well, yeah, I mean, now it's all about, you know, FaceTime. Yeah. You know, now I, uh, my oldest boy, my 15 year old. Oh, 15, okay. The, you know, those, those are pretty cool conversations because they're coming about, you know, they're, yeah. um, you know, they're becoming teenagers and young adults and they know what's going on. And then the six year old, he's just happy to see me whenever he sees me on the phone. Do you, so, they, don't, they don't live with you then? Huh? Where do your sons live? No, they're, they're up north. Okay. I'm in Tampa, yeah. Okay, so they're out of state. That's too bad. So you don't see them that much, huh? Yeah, I've, um, yeah, I saw my 15-year-old a couple of years ago. Okay. And I saw my six-year-old last year. Okay. So it's been, uh, 
it is what it is. I mean, you just have to try to stay positive and optimistic. I mean, I have, I have good conversations with both of them. So that's good. I try to stay as engaged as possible. Do they ever ask about your injury and have questions about that? And how do you answer that? Um, you know, though the six-year-old, he's more like, Daddy, I know you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to make it. Yeah. And um, my 15-year-old, I don't know, I think he's a little, I don't know, it's like a, like a fog. Yeah. You know, like, um, like partially, like disappointed and disconnected a little bit. So I just do my best to engage both of them mm -hmm. with things that they enjoy. That way, they associate me with joy and not, you know, like, oh man, you know, like, you know, my dad's injured or. You know, here goes uh, here goes a tough moment. Like I, right. I try not to burden them. That's good. With, with like with pain, it's more like, hey, what's up? It's it's fun time. You know, like you yeah. know, we're going go now for half an hour. Let's focus on stuff that's fun and enjoyable. That's a really good idea. I know. As a, someone with a spinal cord injury, you have to always be worried about being a, like, even with my family and friends, I'm worried about that kind of same thing where you don't want to bring up your problems too much because, you know. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be a downer. No, Debbie Downer, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you always have to be that one person, no matter who it's with. Yeah. I always find myself having to be like, you know, you know, stay at a 10. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, don't dribble down to like a six or a five. You mm -hmm. got to keep it at 10 because if you don't keep it at 10, it's very easy to plummet down. Damn right. So is. I always find myself um, out of habit being as positive as I can. So do I. I'm the same way. It's the only way to be when you're in, a, like you call it, some kind of a nightmare situation that we find ourselves in. It's... Like you have to. It's the. Only, I feel like it's the best way to cope, and and I've thought about it for a long time. So I mean, it is what it is. I mean, if you yeah have a, a shitty attitude about it, then you're just gonna be miserable every day. You will be. That's a hell. Of, mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you reflect on the good things, then it's tolerable, and you'll get through one day at a time. Yep, that's a good thing. Now, before I let you go, is there any website or you know instagram where people can find you if they want to connect yeah, absolutely you. If you guys want to follow me you can log on to my website which is ulysses martin u-l-y-s-s-e-s-m-a-r-t-i-n.com ulysses martin.com um and then my i have a gofundme going awesome. for physical therapy so okay. there'll be an icon there for the gofundme okay. and then you can also find me on uh, my Instagram account. I'm not too active on Instagram. Yeah. I have, um, I mean, there's quite a bit of history on there. Mm -hmm. I just haven't been active in the past couple months. Okay. But that's uh, Ulysses Martin Network, and you'll find me there on Instagram. Great. And then on TikTok, it's the same thing. Hey, babe, it's Ulysses Martin Network on TikTok? Yeah. Yeah, TikTok, it's Ulysses Martin That's Network. cool. What yeah. kind of TikTok? What kind of TikTok videos do you make? Do you like do you like funny ones? Mm -hmm. I try to do inspirational stuff. That's cool. If I'm gonna find you. I, I don't do any TikTok. I feel like I'm too old, but you're now you're older than me, so I'm gonna you do know, it. The funny thing about TikTok, it's like mm -hmm. I'll get on there and do something super inspirational, yeah, and I only get X amount of hits, and then my kitten gets on there <laughs> and goes meow meow meow. <laughs> Amp kitten got like a half a million hits. Damn cat. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> this is always the case. Babies and animals get all the love on TikTok. It's how it is. Yeah, but my the the best source to reach me is okay. U L Y S S E S Ulysses Martin M A R T I N dot com. Excellent. All right. This has been a good conversation. You know, 
you're one person that I feel out of anyone I've interviewed, you really need, I really hope that we can get some more money for you to get back into rehab. I really want to see you get some more rehab, Mr. Ulysses. Yeah, Tiff, any, um, any resources or individuals you think I can network with, let me know, shoot me an email. I will, I will. I have your email. I'll be in touch. Okay, thank you, Tiff. All right, thank you. Have a great day. Okay, likewise. Yeah, bye-bye.